for us to understand a little bit more about the Brazilian context, which is kind of far away from the American public in general. Uh, let's go down and, oops, let me just give you some background about Brazil first. Brazil is a country in South America, as you know, 100, 186 million inhabitants. We have been a we have been a full democracy since 1985. Uh, we have right now 42.6 million internet users in Brazil. That accounts for 46.3 percent of all South American internet users. We have 100 percent digital elections for the past 10 years. Elections in Brazil are all digital. We don't have paper ballots anymore in the country. And we have no freedom of information law in Brazil, funny enough. Um, here are some other uh, figures about uh, internet usage in Brazil and in South America. As you can see, the nominal figure for Brazil is very high, 42.6 million um, people connected to the internet much more than in other countries of South America, but um, only 22%, 22.4% of the Brazilian population has access to the internet right now. So although the number, the figure is high, uh, the percentage of the population who has access to the internet is still very low. But on the other hand, Brazil um, has been having one of the fastest, fa fa fastest uh, growing rate of people getting connected to the internet and from the year 2000 to 2007 there was there was this increase of uh, 752 percent of the number of people who got connected to the internet in the country okay some more information about e-governance in brazil uh, this is a research conducted by Brown University Center for Public Policy. They do that every year. It's called e-government country rankings for e-governance, of course. And uh, to my surprise, Brazil was ranked number 38 in 2006, and now it, it's being ranked 13th, as you see on that table. Uh, and that's maybe because uh, there has been a trend for all governments at all levels in Brazil to be more present on the internet, uh, but the quality of the services which are being delivered to the Brazilian public is pretty much debatable. Although it's, it's, it's as you can see, this is a uh, very serious research. Uh, it's uh, it's amazing that a third world country like Brazil is is ranking 13th uh, in terms of e-governance. Uh, I'm going to talk about you now after this uh, uh, very quick uh, contextualization of Brazil about two cases that I've been involved with. First one is called Politicos do Brasil, which means politicians from Brazil or Brazilian politicians, if you will. And the other one uh, is uh, related to the Brazilian Association of Investigative Journalism. Uh, as Persephone said, we put together this national forum for right of access to public information in Brazil because we don't have this freedom of information law in Brazil. Let's talk about first about the Politicos. The Politicos uh, is a website. Um, the project was started back in the year 2000. We have more than 25,000 Brazilian politicians listed in this site, covering the three general elections, uh, national general elections. That means 1998, 2002, and 2006 general elections in Brazil. Everybody who ran for office in those elections is listed or maybe most of them, I should say, because, of course, sometimes you cannot get hold of the information of everybody, but everybody who is somebody is there. And um, we ha it's a free search website. Anybody can just hook in and, and, and do searches and, uh, and, and look for uh, information about any politician. Um, and just to give you a flavor of... Um, 
what is this all about? In 2006, when we last updated it, uh, it had an audience on the first day of more than one unique million visitors in that single, on that single day in Brazil, which is huge. It's a huge audience, not only for Brazil, but I think for any standards uh, uh, worldwide. So the objectives of Politicos uh, was to uh, be, as first of all, uh, because it was funded by the newspaper Folha de São Paulo, based in São Paulo, uh, it was uh, supposed to be, and it was actually, a source of news stories for the newspaper. So we produced, out of the information we put together in this database, lots of news stories uh, for the newspaper. Uh, but uh, together with that, we had some side benefits from this uh, project. Uh, for instance, we could check, we journalists and everybody, every citizen in Brazil could, if he or she would be interested in to, check uh, individual records for, from any individual politician. Uh, it was an easy way to get hold of some information about any politician. Because we don't have, as I said, a, a easy way to get it through the authorities because we lack a freedom of information law. We had, of course, a particular interest in election files because in Brazil, uh, for the past three or four decades, actually, there is this uh, mandatory federal regulation that uh, may, makes um, um, uh, any a uh, politician running for public office in the country to file with the federal with the with the election commission in his town or state uh, lots of information including his uh, list of personal assets his list of patrimony and uh, that's supposed to to be a a way uh, for them to be held accountable so that people would know uh, whether uh, uh, they have got more, uh, well, if they got richer during the time they are in office in a way which is not compatible to the salaries they are earning as politicians. Uh, but those documents, although they were being filed by politicians uh, in the past decades, they were never made public except for some major uh, figures in Brazil, major politicians. Uh, and uh, the, the, the whole idea of this database, of this website, was to, to make or to provide all this information to the public in a, in a freely and open uh, way. We use, during this, this we have used during this uh, process uh, what we call in journalism computer-assisted reporting, uh, because we had been receiving the information in several way in several formats. Uh, most of the time, most of the times they came in paper, so we had to type down the information or scan it, and uh, and then we had uh, different sorts of uh, files, and we have to mash them up all together. So we used uh, extensively uh, CAR, as we say, computer-assisted reporting. And uh, of course, the, as I said, the, 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 the beauty of this thing is uh, making possible for people to compare how a politician would be at the beginning of his uh, term as a congressman or a governor or a local legislative uh, officer uh, and uh, compare that beginning situation with the, the, the situation when he is, is about or she is about to leave office. Let's go ahead. This is the, the home page of Politicos do Brasil. It's a very easy uh, database and I'm going to show you um, how it works actually. So you have basically three years, the three elections we had, 1998, 2002, 2006. Then you can choose, for instance, like uh, president. Then you go, buscar is search. It's only in Portuguese, and uh, we don't have a, an English version for that. Uh, hopefully it works. Uh, and then, wow. 
getting a problem here. Let's reload it. Ah, it's coming. Okay. So we got all the politicians who run for president in 2006. Let's choose, for instance, uh, the one who won, Lula. Then you get his personal file, all the information about the politician. And here, when you click here, you just get, or yeah, instantly all his personal assets in the year of 2006. Then you see he has one, two, three apartments and, you know, some savings accounts and all that. But if you want, you can go then and choose from 2002 when he was a candidate again. And then you go and here he is. And uh, let's get rid of that. And... Uh, and uh, this is a different thing because in 2002 we had to scan thousands of uh, of documents. So it's um, it's a PDF stuff, uh, and then this is actually the form filed by the candidate with the election. This is his signature, and here is uh, his declaration of assets, personal assets. So you see how many apartments he has, how many. He has in his savings accounts and all that, and it's all signed. So we have that for 25,000. Uh, we have 25,000 records, um, and uh, that's basically what the database does, and the website offers to anyone interested in it. Let's just go forward here. And uh, here's the example I've just, uh, just given you his assets, and um, of course that generated uh, tons of stories, news stories, not only for Folha de São Paulo, but because the database and the website is open to anyone in Brazil, and because Folha de São Paulo is a national paper, uh, it will be only interested in national uh, people like president, governors, uh, most uh, uh, known people in the country. Uh, we were not interested in local guys, but uh, local newspapers all over Brazil were interested in local guys, so it generated uh, tons of stories around Brazil because it empowered journalists uh, in other states uh, in the countryside to look for information from, uh, well, about the politicians uh, of their local uh, constituencies. And um, that was the first time they had that opportunity and... Uh, uh, we think, I think, uh, that was a, a new mechanism, a new tool to hold politicians a little more accountable in the country. Let's move forward. Uh, just uh, been running out of time. This is about the Forum uh, for Right of Access to Public Information in Brazil. We founded the BRAGI, the Brazilian Association of Investigative Journalism, in 2002. And the Forum was founded in, 2000, in 2003. Abraji, the, the, the association, and I must say Abraji was very much uh, formed uh, with IRE on mind. IRE is the investigative reporters and editors in the United States. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's an association which has been around since 1975 in this country. It's been a pioneer in, in, in the use of uh, computer-assisted reporting and training journalists in this country. And we kind of have some um, contacts with them, and we, I wouldn't say we copied their model, but uh, we, we took what was um, uh, good for the Brazilian reality, and we, we put Abraji together in Brazil. And Abraji, right after it's, um, it was uh, built up, decided to launch this, this new initiative in the country to lobby and put some pressure on the Congress or on the president to, to have a Freedom of Information Act in Brazil to make things more uh, accessible to everybody, not only to journalists, but also to uh, the rank and file anywhere in, in the country interested in public information. Uh, this is... Um, this is the word map showing the countries uh, which already have 
some sort of national freedom of information law enacted. And as you can see in, Latin, in South America, uh, most of the countries are still debating the need of um, a freedom of access to public information. Yes, Ethan? Oh, yeah. Freedominfo.org. I'm going to leave this, this presentation here. If you want, I can, you know. This is a very old map. Actually, it's 2005, but uh, not much things changed since then. Um, this, is, this, is, um, this map is very good for you to think about, to ponder why some countries are still lagging behind in terms of uh, dealing with public information and internet and that kind of stuff. I think it's a, it's a very self-explanatory map. And when you look at Africa and some parts of Asia, you know the whole story. Well, the forum's uh, accomplishment so far, we, we managed to get some 15 congressmen from the Brazilian Congress uh, uh, committed to uh, our uh, effort to push for a freedom of information law in Brazil. We just launched, launched this uh, website for the forum because it's a nonprofit. Uh, we don't have any headquarters. It's pretty much a virtual uh, organization. So we, we managed to get some money from donations from the different uh, institutions that are members of the forum. And we put together this information uh, website uh, talking about the need of uh, a law regulating this right in Brazil. And we have been training people to, to move forward and write requests for public information. And I just have to put a caveat here because Brazil doesn't have a law, but funny enough, we have the right of information, right to have access to public information written in, on our, in our constitution. There is an article in our constitution saying that everybody has to have access to public information, but because that article of our constitution has never been regulated because all the articles in the constitution must have a, a law regulating how it works or how it works in practice. Uh, that has been a rather gray area and some local uh, officers are never certain of uh, the way to deal with those requests. So it's very difficult for people for the rank and file down the road to get some public information. For journalists, it's been a little more uh, uh, efficient, that, uh, that uh, mechanism, uh, that constitution mechanism. And it's possible, although there is no regulation, to push some authorities to give you the information you need. So we have been training people uh, on how to do that. Let me just show you uh, very quickly. This is the this is the website and um, and when you go down here, you have a model of a uh, request. So anyone can print that and you know send it to any public off, uh, government in Brazil, any public agency and uh, and uh, try to get the public information. Although it's going to be difficult, sometimes you have to to sue the, the the local agency to get the information released. Most newspapers in Brazil, or major newspapers, have been doing that. My newspaper has done that a lot of times. And uh, just to go to move forward, uh, this is basically about it. Thank you very much. Um, I've taken a lot of time, and let's go to the Q&A uh, session. Thank you very much. Maybe the Politico Sto Brazil one. Yep. It sounds like it was a lot of manual labor to go yes. out and 
find that document and scan it and you had to go all over the country. Can you talk a little bit about how that sure. worked? And yeah. Problems it, was a, with it? it was basically very time consuming. Uh, it took four years for us to, basically me, to put all that together because uh, the politicians have to file their records with the local election commissions in each one of the 27 Brazilian states. Uh, when they are deciding to run for office, they have a local authority and then they have to go and f fill out the papers and that's going to be filed locally. So I had to go sometimes in person to several of the Brazilian states and I was fortunate enough to have my paper supporting me in doing that, which was amazing in a way because <laughs> we never know whether that would uh, end up in a good story because I could fail and not get any papers and the maximum I would have would be a story about how Brazil is miserable in terms of right of access to public information, which is something I already, uh, everybody knew in Brazil. So uh, it took me four years. I started in the year 2000 and then in the year 2002, right before the election, the general elections, which is, uh, uh, which happens in Brazil every October of uh, a election year. Right before that, we managed to put that together and that was online. Uh, it was an instant success. We got several awards for that. We produced several stories, a series of uh, news stories about inconsistencies in the declarations of, uh, of some certain politicians. And uh, so it was great. Uh, and uh, as you said, and as you mentioned, the, the major difficulty until 2002 was the fact that um, the information filed by the politicians, really strange, uh, they were all in paper. They were uh, never giving us uh, the information in the digital form. So we had basically me and one intern to sort that out, all the papers, and scan one by one all those thousands of pages and uh, put them together in a you know, readable form uh, and then feed the database. That was the major difficulty. In 2006, because uh, I would say, uh, because we, we, we put so much pressure on the Federal Elections Commission in Brazil, and they gave us, they started the, the, the local commissions uh, in the, within the 27 states, they start up to give us the information already in a digital form. So that's why when you go to 2002 and 1998, you just have uh, PDFs and when you go to 2006, you have uh, all digitalized uh, in a way, it's all typed. So it's, it's pretty more searchable, uh, but we, we could not afford to type all the information from previous years, but I think Anyway, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very easy if you, if you want to, to compare one with the other, you, you can do it very easily. So uh, just to make a long story short, the, the major difficulty was, was technical and uh, political because we had to convince the local agencies, the local election uh, agencies that we uh, had the right to put our hands on those informations. And uh, sometimes we had to go to court and file suit because they were not willing to give us. So that, that's why it took so long. But um, we succeeded in the end. That's it. Yes? Do you know uh, whether this model is being um, adopted or whether the problem is the same and some other... Latin American countries, for example, Mexico, Venezuela, Colombia, Argentina, uh, any, any of them, so I mean, yeah. Nicaragua, yeah. Well, so far, uh, as far as I know, uh, it has not been replicated anywhere. Uh, but you have to bear in mind that it's necessary to have some sort of provision in the country that would make mandatory for politicians to file those informations. Otherwise, you would have to go individually to any politician, to all the politicians to get that information. No, I do not know. And I know that 
as far as freedom of information, well, freedom of, of, uh, of right of access to information, Mexico is pretty much ahead of all other Latin American countries so far. They have this law, which was enacted in 2002, which is, uh, to my well, regard, very effective so far. Uh, it's something that should be seen in a way as a model for other Latin American countries because it's been working very well in Mexico, as far as I know. Uh, but they don't have anything that would oblige politicians to file that sort of information. That's the problem. They have the law, which will empower people to have public information, but not that type of information. So that's it. Yes. I, don't have any, um, I understand that the site includes not only the declaration of assets, but also the tax identifier number of each of these politicians, that's, including candidates who ran and didn't get elected. That's right. Yeah. Have very you good not question. had any privacy challenges on that? Oh yeah. We. <laughs> uh, you will see here. Persephone is asking me, is asking me about this figure, this this number here. This is basically what will be here, the social security number. We publish 25,000 social security numbers of politicians in Brazil on our website. So that makes it possible for anyone to pick up that number. And we actually teach people how to do it and go. <laughs> if you click here, it's, it's really, this is really something. This is another source, endless source for, for a news story. It's, it says here, Saiba Como, know how to check the CPF, CPF is the social security number, of politicians and their fiscal situation. So when you click here, it's actually a manual on how you should use that number to check whether that guy is uh, paying his or her taxes. And uh, people were very angry at us, but uh, we... Uh, decided we should do that and um, I happen to be based in Brasilia and before I did it I went into this this is being broadcast but I'm, I'm not gonna say anything improper here I went to the Supreme Court and talked to to some judges there's some justices there and uh, asked them whether we could as a newspaper send them a that's possible within the Brazilian judicial system to send them as, as a newspaper a, a, a formal uh, question about whether politicians should have or not that number disclosed in Brazil. What, what will be their, their understanding of it? So before we put this online, we send this, requ this formal request to the Brazilian Supreme Court and they decided formally that that was not a judgment, but that it was just a consultation. And they responded to us. They gave us a letter saying that politicians, because they are in public life, there is no impediment whatsoever for a newspaper or a website to publish any information regarding their uh, uh, fiscal situation. Because we are not disclosing actually the, the salaries of the politicians. We are just disclosing whether they pay or not pay taxes, which is something different. Uh, but the salaries of politicians are public, any, are public anyway. Everybody knows because that's a pattern for that. There is a pattern for that. So, uh, yes, uh, that was a very, very useful tool. Uh, of the website as well. Thank you for asking that. I was kind of uh, not remembering that. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Had any way of knowing whether this information affected voting patterns or whether people who were exposed as having not been honest? I don't, yeah, yeah good question. Uh, I don't have any scientific information on that because there is no research focusing on voters' turnout or interest of the voters in politics or that kind of stuff. But um, the only uh, objective information I would have to, to give you about it is the audience of the website, which is being enormous. And I suppose that because 
so many people searched searched through the website, more people were having a more conscious decision and <laughs> at the time they were going to vote in Brazil. That's that's my understanding. Uh, but I don't have any any specific answer about whether more people were voting or getting involved in politics because of it. But my hunch, if I have any, would be that, yes, it helped a lot to improve the political standards in Brazil. There's a, there's a real sort of trend towards these sort of government information sites in the U.S. right now. There's a whole oh, yeah. foundation, Sunlight Foundation, Open Secret, focused on these sorts of things. Uh, they work for you in the UK. Um, one of the things that I find very interesting about this is that you guys did this very much from a journalistic perspective, right. and with the idea being that it was to help um, your newspaper, help other smaller newspapers sort of gain these stories. Do you think that the audience for this sort of work, this sort of public transparency work, is the general public? <laughs> Is it activists? Is it journalists? Who, who are we building these resources for, and who does it make sense to build these resources for? Very good question. Uh, I think at the beginning that the major, uh, well, most of the people who would be interested in it will be journalists, because it's, uh, as I said, an endless source of uh, stories. You, you can... Uh, I was, last week, someone was sending me an email from the Rio de Janeiro newspaper to interview me about some details of this, and it, it made the, the, front line, the, the front page headline of this, this newspaper last week, and this has been online for two years now, last the updated in 2006. Uh, so it's an endless source of stories, but uh, because I, we don't have... Uh, that many journalists in Brazil. We had a million unique visitors on the first day. So I suppose it's all types of persons. It's all type of people who would be interested in it. Uh, uh, of course, we have a curve of audience and uh, the, the prime time for this is prior to the election. It's election year. Right now, it doesn't get much of an audience, uh, but uh, I believe during election years, it's pretty much everybody. It was like uh, so much talked about. It was all over the internet. All the bloggers were talking about it. They were posting notes about it. They were comparing uh, this politician from the Amazon region. You know, nobody had heard about it. He, he or she were there, and they would say, wow, this is, this is new. And uh, I think it, uh, it draw uh, attention from all sorts of publics. Uh, during the election year. And after that, after that curve goes down, then it becomes something for journalists, which is right now. What's the biggest story that's broken from it? What's the biggest scandal that, that someone's pulled out of that? So many. I, pick, I pick, pick, pick a good one. <laughs> well, I would say you can... Let me just go here and show you. It's um, the increase of patrimony of politicians in Brazil being much higher than the increase of the regular average Brazilian taxpayer. And you have all the stories here. You can check on that. Let me just see. And, and you should probably find patrimony. Yeah. Patrimony yeah. assets, personal, uh, at like apartment, uh, cars, boats. Net worth. Net worth. Net worth. Net worth. Net worth. Net worth. Yeah. Let's go and see here. Yeah, they are doing very well. <laughs> it attracts more good people. <laughs> yeah. And then you see... that's worked real well in Kenya, so... Well, yeah. The, basically, I would say uh, the, the major story was how much in personal assets do Brazilian politicians <laughs> accumulated over the years. Yep. We had that beautiful figure to put on the headline, which was like a billion or something, and it was increasing at a rate of uh, tenfold the inflation rate of Brazil or something. It was yep. kind of a, yeah. I, ca I can't recall the yeah. exact figure, but that was the major uh, uh, impact story, in my opinion. But we had 
tons of stories about inconsistencies in the documents filed by politicians in the real life they were having uh, in their local towns. Uh, we had, uh, we had uh, several local newspapers doing that. I'll just show you one, which was very good, if I may. Do we have time? Yeah, we yeah sure. Time here. I'm going to show you right away. It, um, it was uh, the, actually a major competitor of Folha de São Paulo, the, a newspaper from O Globo, from Rio de Janeiro called O Globo. And uh, they uh, picked up some information from us, and they <laughs> came out with uh, this. Let me show you this. Oh, no, that's not the one. Hold on. That's it. I was planning to show you this right up the, from the beginning, but it's um, OK. It's, uh, it's uh, let's see. It's here. OK. That's really good. That's a very good story. That's a, a practical example of what happened. And I decided to choose this one because it's not from my newspaper. It's from a competitor newspaper that used our database, which was, I was glad with it. My editors were not that glad, but uh, again, I thought it was great. This politician was a former governor of this unknown state for you guys, Maranhão, which is, you know, right at the northeast region of Brazil. So his assets within Politico's database were like this. In 2002, like half a million reais, which is roughly, uh, you divide by two, so it's roughly $250,000. And in 1998, he had about 400,000 uh, reais. And the change from 98 to 2002 was 41%. But when he was about to leave office, this is this, you know, official records, official assets, there you go, it's all signed by him, it's all official. The politicians were filing these records very easily and with no concern because no one was going after them. So they could lie, even it was in print because no one was seeing that. And then, look at that, he bought this penthouse for three million reais. So they discovered that. So this is the this is the story. And how could he? So uh, big scandal. You know, uh, uh, former governor is currently in jail, facing ch well. That was last year. I don't know whether he's still in jail. And uh, this is you know another example here. A real a politician declared just a regular house for you know very tiny value. But see what the reporters found when they went to the address. So he said, I have this, this very humble house, you know, worth like 10,000 reais or something. And then they went there to see it, and they took this picture. And this is really, it, it's self-explanatory. It's a good news story. And uh, the Million Dollar Club in Rio, that's, you know, that's all our competitors using our database. I think that's, that's beautiful. And uh, this is like they compare the evolution of assets of every politician over the years now. It's very feasible to do that, very easy. So that's the kind of story. And this is the one which just came out last week from this other newspaper from Rio de Janeiro about the patrimony or assets, net assets of the political uh, people in Brazil uh, was, you know, uh, increasing at a pace of 41.8%, which is huge. That's over uh, a election, full election cycle, four years, which is much more than inflation. And inflation in Brazil is around 3 to 4% a year nowadays. And uh, that's good. <laughs> Those people are doing good. They should be asked to come over here and, and help George W. Bush to handle the, the recession here because they're, they're really smart people, yeah. <laughs> okay. Congratulations on the story. The theories behind 
how to break the cycle of corruption. One is the information is not available to the electorate. The other part is that the electorate doesn't really care that much that they're interested in, uh, in other things. Are there counter examples of people who have had unwarranted gains in their wealth that have gone ahead despite the information being publicly available and, and been reelected to office? What do you mean exactly? People? You, you go on the website, you see this person has doubled his wealth while yeah. being in office for four years or six years, and people go, ah, whatever, we like him, and re-elect him. Are, well, are there, is there anecdotal evidence of that? Has anyone looked at that? That's a good question. I don't know, actually, but I think I would say yes. I would say people still would vote for those bastards, too. Yeah. <laughs> it's democracy, you know. Yeah, so it happens, yeah. This builds on Rob's question, but what's the sort of public perception of corruption? I, I just pulled up the, the Transparency International Corruption Perception Index, and Brazil doesn't rank well. It, it comes in uh, 72nd in the world China, with uh, India, China, Mexico, Morocco, um, some nations that are, that are pretty notoriously corrupt. I, I mean, do these stories come out and everyone goes, well, of course, they're all thieves? Or is there, is there an aspect of shock? to this? Is there a sense that if you guys run 10, 15, 20 stories, this is going to change? Or is this just going to be, this is the daily diet of what newspapers do, but this is also the way the country runs? Thank you. I liked your, your question so much because this index put together by Transparency International is so bad, I think. I have many friends with Transparency International and Transparency Brazil, but I think that's, that's a misconception of what corruption is all about, because in Brazil we have been in a democracy for more than two decades in a row now, fortunately, very stable, uh, lot, rule of law, everything, and above all, a free media, very lively, competitive media in Brazil and we have been chasing the bad guys so hard in the past two decades and we have had so many stories about corruption and what's being doing wrongly in within the government at all levels that one might have the wrong impression that everybody is a thief as you said and uh, the the, the index put together by Transparency International is about impressions that people have. It's not that it's, it's only a bad thing, but uh, it's, it's just one aspect of life in different countries. I think more should be put together. I think the standards of Brazilian politicians are as bad as in, not, in, in any other countries, but because maybe we have this transparent way of dealing with everything nowadays in Brazil. It looks like to some people that there are more corrupt people in Brazil than in other places. We don't listen much about Paraguay or whatever because they don't have much of a free media there sometimes. And uh, so, yeah, well, thank you for asking that. I think it's, uh, it's really a misconception, that index. I, let me just follow up to that and say that I took part, as I am a member of ICIJ as well, International Consortium of Investiga Investigative Journalists in Washington, uh, which is an international network of investigative reporters around the world in 50 countries. We are 100 people. And we, uh, in 2003, started up this project called Global, in, uh, Global Integrity Index, which evolved into a new organization. I'm not part of it anymore. I've just took part at the beginning of it. It's on the internet. Just type, just Google it, Global uh, Integrity Index. And we decided we should go after uh, measuring corruption in another way rather than Transparency International. Instead of uh, asking people whether they feel their country is corrupt, we would go and see how the institutions were functioning in different countries and how people would have access to anti-corruption mechanisms in those countries. That would be a more precise way to see the state of corruption in different countries. 
And of course, because corruption is not a measurable uh, uh, thing, it's impossible to measure corruption. Yes, sorry. Over here. Curious about another aspect of um, what we see here uh, in political situations, which becomes a focus, which is conflict of interest um, problem involving politicians, which may or may not uh, show up may or may not be relevant in terms of increases in net worth. It's in fact possible that a politician's assets may increase over a period of time. At, on your numbers, it might have been 10 or 12 percent a year, and that might be reasonable. But the stock market went up, and it was perfectly okay, because they had assets when they started and they grew. But what's often of more concern is conflicts of interest where here, lobbyists will um, give special favors or respond, or politicians will respond to uh, special interest requests. Um, and I wonder in Brazil whether, whether e either the sites or material you've shown us or other things try and control or uh, highlight these conflicts of interest between industrial companies, whether they're in Brazil or outside of Brazil, and Brazilian politicians. I quite not grasped those. So conflicts of interest where uh, a construction company says, uh, or a defense or, or an airplane manufacturer yeah, says I, to a politician, um, maybe I'll pay you, but um, Maybe uh, I will support your next campaign financially, so uh -huh. you can run for president or run for governor or run for senator. And in exchange for that, I hope you'll give me support when I ask you to support a bill for for um, tax exemption for pharmaceutical well, tax companies. exemptions or because yeah. the government. Uh, I want you to buy more airplanes that I produce. Yeah. Yeah. Those kinds of things. So those kinds of of concrete conflicts of interest. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we are not as advanced as, as you are here in this country in tracing those uh, lobby lobbyists and and uh, like Baxter's interests, uh, like the Center for Public Integrity in Washington here, the Open Secrets Foundation. They will do a great job here. Uh, we are trying to mimic those experiences in Brazil, but we have had no success so far because um, uh, it's a new initiative in Brazil. We are trying to trace out all the funders for politicians, but because informal and soft money in Brazil is m much more dramatic even then here in this country, so it's been a little difficult for us to, to trace out the, the, the lobbyists and who is behind every politician in the country. But that's certainly something that we will be heading to in the next years uh, because, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, yeah, we, we already have access to that, but as I said, major companies and major uh, donors would do that in a way which is untraceable. We cannot get hold of the information because it's not straight into the politician or into the politician's party. It's uh, unofficial and illegal, of course. Uh, so we are still developing other ways to do that because the, the quality of the public and official data on that in Brazil is very poor. Uh, yes. This is just uh, follow up what uh, Ethan said. This is the Global Global Integrity Index, which is a competitor to Transparency International. It's much smaller because uh, it doesn't include as many countries as Transparency International. Uh, but that includes 290 indicators in each country. 290 indicators in each country are put together and then they developed this this index which is much more precise for measuring corruption in in several countries rather than the one from transparency international in my opinion
People who do a lot of work in governance in the developing world get very worried about the fact that some of the countries that are doing the best jobs with transforming their governance. So, you know, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, um, Ghana, Uganda, Botswana um, tend to come up pretty poorly on TI's survey, um, but are clearly moving in the right direction. And uh, TI survey is really weird. I mean, what you basically do is you grab a bunch of international business mm -hmm. people, you can do it at Davos, and you pull them aside and mm -hmm. say, hey, Rob, as an international businessman, just how corrupt is Brazil on a scale Brazil. from one to seven? <laughs> and you give it a three, and I give it a four, mm -hmm. and the rating ends up being 3.5. And it's a perception, and these perceptions, as it turns out, can take decades to change. Yeah. But what it's really measuring is sort of the brand of a nation oh. more than anything else. Yeah. Um, did you, whereas, did you know this? Uh, I had heard of it. I hadn't looked in close detail. And what I'm sort of amazed by is is looking on this at, you know, the, the moderate rating. And the countries that come out in the moderate set are Argentina, B Benin, Brazil, Bulgaria, Ethiopia, Georgia, Ghana, India, Kenya, Nigeria, Philippines, and Uganda. And out of that list... You know, the vast majority of them are sort of fairly happy governance stories over the last decade. Uh, if we admit uh, Kenya because of recent problems, Georgia because of recent problems, and Ethiopia because it's run by a madman, the rest of them, for the most part, are pretty good narratives about strengthening of the public sector, which ends up being a really interesting relationship to that index. So. Is there really recent problems, so just we happen to find out about it recently? What's that? Are there really re only recent problems, so we just found, they just came up to light? Yeah, well, I mean, this is a, a 2006 <laughs> index, so. Well, yes? I would like to ask some questions regarding the funding of this initiative. As far as I understood, up to now, it was been funded by the newspaper. Right. Um, I would like to ask you firstly if the newspaper is owned by any company with a political interest or something. Mm -hmm. Second question is the fact that um, you are providing with your the resources of the newspaper so many stories for other newspapers that are actually competitors doesn't constitute a disincentive for the newspaper to keep doing this. And thirdly, uh, in to what extent this initiative is depending on you? If for some reason you leave the the, the newspaper, will this uh, initiative keep going or we'll see? Okay. Uh, the ownership of the newspaper is uh, traditional. It's a family run business, like in this country, most of the newspapers are, or for the word, <laughs> yes. So it's. Um, it's a very successful newspaper. Uh, as I said, Persephone said, it's the best-selling paper in Brazil, a quality paper, very influential. Uh, this project added to the credibility of the newspaper because we won several awards for that. Everybody was um, uh, recognizing the newspaper as the major uh, supporter of this idea which was related to more democracy and transparency in Brazil. So I think the gain for the newspaper was adding to its already good image some more elements that would last for, for a while. And that's uh, basically what the old media is all about, being credible uh, and influential. Uh, and they have to stick with that in order to survive and compete with the new media, which is pretty much sometimes the opposite. Not credible, not not much of a good image, and not reliable, but old media tends to be, some of them, very reliable, credible, influential, and they have to to build up on that in order to survive and to go through this this very uh, transition, this, this transition period in which we are right now all over the world. Uh, so I think that's why they supported it, and they still supporting it now. As far as the, as you put it, the, the, the disincentive for the newspaper, because it was uh, fueling some competitors to write news stories, uh, uh, I don't think that's, that's a, a major issue. It's an issue, but it's not a major issue. Because we were knowing right from the beginning that would happen. 
And what we did is uh, before we put the, the database uh, online, we prepared tons of stories so that we were ready to go at least at the same time as our, as our competitors. And we put the major stories before everybody because we knew beforehand everything. And then you had all those stories that I chose, but uh, those, were, they were, those, those were nice stories, but they were not the major ones because the major ones were already published by us. So I think that's, that's just a minor issue. And uh, the third point, you said how much this project is, is depending on me. Well, that's hard to say. Yes, it is basically me because I run it since uh, right from the beginning. I had the idea, and uh, but I don't have any plans to leave the newspaper or the the, the internet portal. So that's not something I have thought about it. And uh, hopefully, I can be there for 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 a while and 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 keep things on. Yes. I'm curious. Has this helped the newspaper business? Has it helped it? Well, indirectly, yes, I think. That's, as I said, when you build up on your good image and you add to your credibility and, and how influential you are in the country in putting you know, the news stories first and having the scoops. Did it help, say, circulation? Did it, did it bump oh, up no. Oh, because no. you had this million hits. Yeah. I was wondering if it bled over into the... Very sadly, no, side. no, no. <laughs> and circulation has been stuck all over the world, isn't it? Yeah. It's something like it's it's uh, at most being stable, mm -hmm. just pretty much as here. Uh, and as far as being stabilized, it's good because uh, otherwise it's going to go down. That's what people say. And it's only a matter of time. Nobody knows how much time, but uh, it's a matter of time for circulation to decline even more than what it has already declined in, in the past years. It's been stable and in Brazil, the circulation of major newspapers uh, in the past uh, couple of years, I would say. Yes, please. Uh, has anybody resigned as a politician or withdrew from um, the current elections at the time when this came out? Or has returned any money or gi given a donation to a charitable organization so they could stay in an elected office or anything like that? Uh, you know, politicians are people build up without super ego, so they just they they just move ahead and they they lose face, but they just go ahead. No, they they've not resigned. <laughs> they be there. Come yeah, on. they're running for office. Yeah, they said this this is something from my enemies. It's a misunderstanding. Uh, Let me just explain it to you, and you know, they just move ahead. Yes. Some of them had fa have been facing legal uh, uh, charges as that governor, but uh, he is still a politician. He is, you know, trying to run for office again, and that's it. The guy in jail. The guy in jail, yeah. How do we turn this into a movement? How does, so for this to happen in Brazil, you already had on the books an incredibly useful law, which is this patrimony law as far as political assets, right? I'd love to get this law passed in Kenya. Uh, well, let's not use Kenya, it's a bad example though. I'd love to get it passed in Ghana. Okay. Uh, which China. also... Or China. Yeah. <laughs> Let me talk about a country that I know. You get to talk about China. I'll talk about Ghana. We'll stick to our own continents. I'd love to get this passed in Ghana. At the same time, this example is going to make Ghanaian politicians really nervous oh, about yeah. it. So how do we take what's a really exciting story, what's clearly an amazing tool for journalists, what in the long term will be a really good tool for citizens, how do we export this revolution? And, and is this something that you're actively trying to do, having had such great success in Brazil? I have been having lots of work already trying to keep this up, so I have not had the chance to <laughs> go international in a Trotskyist way. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Make an international revolution, whatever. Uh, but... Um, Yes, I think it would be wonderful if uh, we could have something like that uh, in other countries. But the way to do that 
as far as I learned from my experience as a journalist in the past 20 or so years is that no uh, initiative would be successful without massive initiative like this will be of having a law passed like this one in other countries will never be successful without massive public support or a very uh, uh, with the various uh, uh, actors of, of that particular society involved truly involved and committed to do something like that so you have to start up putting together a as we did in brazil for the freedom of information law a forum because it starts like a interest of a particular group take the story of the freedom of information act in this country you started up talking about freedom of information act or a freedom or right of access to public information back in 1954 because of those nuclear tests in the South Pacific. Then it took 12 or 14 years for Lyndon Johnson to sign up the, the freedom of information law in this country. Uh, so it's a very long uh, process of getting something done. It starts up generally in terms of public information within the journalistic environment because journalists work with information, so they need it. But this is something I've learned from the Freedom of Information Act in this country. Less than 5% of the requests came from, come from journalists themselves. 95% of the requests for public information at federal level in this country will come from people who are not journalists or working for media companies, uh, which, which tells you that there is a general demand and interest for that. But journalists have to be involved at the beginning because they would be the ones who would be more uh, willing to get there. They would be eager to, to have something like a law for politicians to disclose their personal assets. So in Ghana, I would say a good path would be to start up convincing news media, major news companies to hop into that and... Uh, try to get together and build up a movement and then aggregating more uh, people from other sectors of the society. That's what we did with the forum in Brazil. We started up as a journalist and then we invited judges, we invited businessmen, we invited lawyers, everybody to be together and to show that this is a general, it's, this is in the general interest of society. It's not a journalist's thing because journalists are nosy, they want to have that, and, you know, let's just, that's bad. So we have to kind of a broad, have a broad uh, 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 initiative in order to, to be successful. Yes? I think that it, um, it's not so important about the information you have, but just creating the site and the idea of accountability, the idea that someone is watching. Like, for example, I was trying to do this in Morocco. It didn't happen because it was too sensitive for anyone to fund it. But just putting down, did your representative graduate from high school? Mm -hmm. You know, just not even about their finances, but just any sense of accountability and having that up on the web. Um, because you can't always wait for, you know. Well, and, and, and this is, the reason I brought up Kenya at first was that a very dear friend of a number of ours here, Oreo Kola, a former HLS student, former Berkman affiliate, uh, is running a site now in Kenya called Mizalendo. And what happened in the Kenyan parliament was the parliament paid to have a website done that had detailed dossiers on every parliamentarian. And what happened was all over the place you had parliamentarians who said, well, yes, I have a doctorate from Oxford University. And then their formal bio would go up on the website and it would say that they hadn't completed primary school. And this was extremely embarrassing. It was so embarrassing that the Parliament website went live for three days and then was taken offline for two and a half years. And these friends of mine, who are Kenyan hackers, basically got a full copy of the website and just put it up themselves and essentially said, look, you need to know this. But it's a hard revolution to move in that case because really what it is are extremely resourceful Kenyan hackers 
but the media isn't behind them mm -hmm. yet. And in many ways, this to me looks like a much more sustainable model. Oh, yeah. Get the media, because the media know <laughs> they need this data. But then, you know, quickly figure out how you build a coalition around the judiciary, around the lawyers, around other interested groups. My guess on that, that U.S. figure, by the way, of 95%, of is that it's not a lot of individuals no. filing FOIA requests. It's almost exclusively either corporations or NGOs. You know and what? a lot of lobbyists. Inmates. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Lots of inmates. Hmm. They don't have anything to do, they keep on. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess it has to be that civil society is a big chunk oh, of yeah. that. Yeah. And uh, what well, those figures about the American Freedom of Information Act are available. Anyone can go and look at them. But uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes? Perhaps they have preconceived notions of Brazil. Um, but how, in a society that is so corrupt and everybody would be so against it? the politicians would vote about this patrimony law in the first place. I don't quite understand that. I'm That's a really nice question. It was in place for the past 40 years and has never been used by journalists or the media or anybody. But even for It was passed <laughs> during the dictatorship. Hmm. So it were the generals who imposed that law on the politicians during the, the the, 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 the military dictatorship, Brazil endured this, this, this right-wing military dictatorship from 1964 to 1985, 21 years. And back in the beginning of the dictatorship, which was um, with the coup d'etat, one of the, the main ideas of the coup d'etat was that they were coming in to get rid of the corruption politicians, the corrupt politicians in Brazil. And they enacted some laws like this one, uh, to show people that they were actually ridding corruption from Brazil. But because we didn't have democracy and the politicians were all like people related to generals and to the dictatorship, the law was pretty much useless at the beginning. Then it was dormant for two decades in a row. Then we had democracy. Other things were at stake and more important at the beginning of the return of the country to the democracy. And then in the 90s, people started up looking more at those uh, laws that we have in our judicial framework and it started up trying to use that a little more. And uh, it culminated with this database when I decided to request all the documents filed by all the politicians, because prior to that in the 90s, which was very common, was for was was news was was uh, to request only the declarations from people running for president or governor of Sao Paulo or senator of Rio, important guys that would be there, and then you wouldn't find anything wrong with those because they would know it would be difficult for them if they lied. Uh, in those forms. But then I decided to go in a broader way and I requested all the declarations and then things begin to be a little more different. But uh, uh, to, 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 to answer your question, the law was not passed by those politicians being shown here. It was something very old from dictatorship times. So that, that's why it was possible. I think, I doubt if we didn't have that, it would be possible to get that in an easy way right now. You, you're right. Did, was they so um, sort of cocky that they're gonna have such a dictatorship that they were not afraid of disclosure and that's why it passed? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because the, the Congress was, by the generals. It was entirely controlled. We still had a, it was a very funny dictatorship because we had elections, we had a Congress, uh, it was a dictatorship. They dominated everything. Uh, we could not actually elect the people we wanted to, to, to have elected, but it was like a fake democracy and uh, it was a dictatorship. And they, because they, they thought they, they shouldn't be afraid of this, they, they passed it. And, um, well, and fortunately enough, it's been there, and uh, no one is going to remove it right now. And the reason they were not afraid of it is because they knew they were going to keep it as a dictatorship. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and they lasted for 21 years. So. 
Yeah. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, not anymore now. It, it's while well, situation for journalists in Brazil is not the best one in the world, but because I work for a mainstream news media based in Sao Paulo, so the threats against people like me would be minimized or minuscule or will not exist, I would say nowadays, but uh, the situation in <coughs> countryside states will be very fierce. And I, the only time I faced some direct threats was 11 years ago in 1997 when I put out this story about the, this, this scheme within the Brazilian Congress, this vote buying scheme. Congressmen were voting for money and I had some ev like concrete evidence of it and some congressmen were expelled from Congress. It was a big scandal. It lasted for three or four months. Then I got some direct threats by telephone and things like that. I, the newspaper had to put a bodyguard to follow me around. It lasted for three months, but uh, that was the last time it happened 11 years ago, fortunately. Yeah, we use the database to to do that because and before this website, do you have some examples? For example, do you see some example in America or so, or just uh, you created the yeah, The Question was why I have decided to do this. Where where did I get the idea from? Um, the answer is um, I've been always a computer <laughs> internet junkie, mm -hmm. been going to these workshops about computer-assisted reporting, uh, looking at experiences in other countries and mostly, most of the time here in this country. And I thought I should do something there in Brazil. I was kind of um, you know, going through and touching the ground to see which one would be feasible. And then I ended up doing this. But uh, I picked up examples from other countries most of the time from, from the United States. And uh, uh, I mentioned invest, investigative reporters and editors, IRE. That's a very inspiring uh, uh, institution, organization. I would strongly recommend for journalists or anybody to go sometime to go and search and surf their website. It's, um, it's very enlightening. It gives you lots of ideas of what to do with the internet in, in, in those along those lines. So, uh, Marcia, it's time to end, so I think we will thank Fernando again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Really interesting project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.